In this episode of Ignition GT, I chat to World Rallycross driver Johan Christofferson. The more practice I can do, the better driver I become. And as long as I will do motorsport, I will do 110%. We look at highlights from the Los Angeles Motor Show. I love the moisture sensors that they have, which is in the wheel arches for detecting uh, slip. It's the best system I've ever felt in dampish conditions. And Zipporah gets behind the wheel of a brutish Mercedes AMG G63. What Mercedes-Benz has done is reworked the suspension as well as the chassis. And this gives a really good compliant ride. Hello and welcome to this week's show. Coming to you from the grid of what is without a doubt the best motorsport spectacle in the world, the FIA World Rallycross Championship, back in Cape Town for a second visit. This is where the drivers line up and launch from 0 to 100 in two seconds before they attack turn one at 160 kilometers an hour. The sport has got some of the biggest names in the world competing, but for the last two years, it's been dominated by Johan Christofferson. We were lucky enough to catch up with him here in Cape Town. The FIA World Rallycross Championship has, without a doubt, the best collection of racing drivers in the world. And sitting proudly at the top of that pile is Johan Christofferson, back-to-back -back champions. No one can touch you. It feels good. Yeah, it feels very good. It feels very good. I'm really, if I could choose any sport or any motorsport, let's say, and uh, in any team, any car, I would be exactly where I am. So yeah, I'm, I'm a very happy man. I was at the final round in Buxtehude and you know what amazed me is that championships wrapped up but you've got this, this fight in you, this hunger to win at all costs. Uh, where does that come from? I think, I mean, from the bottom, I mean, since I was really, really young, I started to compete in everything. I mean, in everything. The jump into the car, put the seat back on fastest, like run to, run over the crossroad, whatever it was, I was competing in everything. And Were I, you a second child in a family? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you always, okay, yeah. that, that makes so, sense. <laughs> yeah, so I, I always been competitive. And then, you know, to, to really try, like, if we say Buxtehude, it's been a racetrack that I've never succeeded before, I've never been in the final. So I really, I, I came there as a champion last year, and I messed up that weekend. So this year, when I arrived as a champion, I was like, okay, now I'm really going to do 100% focusing on this event, try to, to make it as good as possible, because it's going to be, because I always do the good preparation before the weekend. and going to Buxtehude with good preparation is going to be the actual black and white if am I doing the stuff that I'm doing before is it giving anything or not so I did all the preparations I could and I was able to win the event so that meant a lot to me. That is important because you know, winning a championship may be easy but it's maintaining that position at the top that is really difficult and I think it's that precision, that dedication. I mean, you've also broken a record that had been standing. I think 2016, Andreas Buckerud had the perfect weekend. You've gone and done that this season. You have to be 100% motivated to do all the work that it takes to, to, to be able to stay on the top after a season like last year. A season like last year was also record-breaking in, in some terms. But anyway, you know, to, to come back and try to defend the title and, and do it actually even better with the highest level of competition that's ever been in Rallycross is it, it takes a lot of hard work, but it also takes a, a good team around me, which I'm feeling 100% comfortable with. with They're always delivering a perfect car for me, and, and then to have Petter as a teammate to, to share the information with is very important. Look, I, I think that, that is really cool. There's a transition in World Rallycross at the moment from the old style Peter Solberg way of driving to your more circuit focused almost precision but a lot you can learn from a, a wily old fox like Peter. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, he have a lot of experience back from the rally. He have a good car no knowledge to, to know how to set up the car and to feeling for the car, what can make it even faster uh, in terms of the gravel and, and rally style. And I'm a little bit more of looking into the data and, and try to optimize the car for that specific track. So we are working very well together and putting all these things together in one big, uh, you know, pot and try to, to make the best out of it has been working very, very good. And, as you say, I mean the old style of driving a little bit is, is outgoing and this is because of also the Relicos tracks is going more towards uh, circuit racing in terms of tarmac and, and concrete instead, of, instead of, of gravel. Is that a good thing? Uh, I think it's pluses and minus. I mean I also like the gravel and, and you know it's it mixes up the, the driving style a little bit more. Uh, the bad thing with, with gravel is that uh, when the cars are so dynamic in terms of suspension and so on, like it is nowadays, and also have all the power that we have, it digs the big holes in the, in the gravel and it makes the car break down in terms of punctures and so on. So I think it's too many cars on one race weekend to, to have a lot of gravel. If we have less cars and limited of driving, I think we could have more gravel. Yeah, I suppose that was before it became this global series, that is why you could have it. So I, I get that. But it wasn't always motor racing for you. I mean, you didn't grow up and say, that's what you want to do. You, you went to cross-country skiing, long life, as the Germans would call it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, that was because of that. That was My father was doing racing when, when I was young. Yeah. Uh, so when I grew up in a service park, his free time was actually to doing uh, uh, cross country skiing. And as competitive person as I was, I went straight into, okay, let's be the best in, in, in cross country skiing. So when I was six, seven years old, I was before going to school, I was in the, in the garden doing cross country skiing, you know, seven o'clock in the morning. So I always been quite driven and try to, to maximize what I'm doing. And I did that 100% until I was 19, 20 years old. So I made it up to the top in juniors in Sweden. Yeah. And then I started with circuit racing when my father stopped his, his racing career. So that was the first time for me there was an opportunity to race myself and I get stuck from there. Yeah, and I mean, it's the end of the season, final round, going into the winter break. Things are intense on a race weekend. There are interviews like this happening all the time. What, is, what does Johan do to get away and, and de-stress? Yeah, it's, it's really busy. I mean, I'm not, all, I'm not only doing the rallycross. I'm also doing circuit racing in Sweden. So I'm doing like 20 race weekends a year. And on top of that, I, I, during the winter time, I try to keep me up to pace with, with rallying in Sweden on snow. So actually, the weekend after I arrive back home, uh, I will go straight for testing in circuit racing. <laughs> so you actually relax and unwind strapped into another race car? Yeah, exactly. So I have 220 plus uh, travel days a year. So it is a lot, but I think that's also Again, the mentality that I took from cross-country skiing, that I have, the more practice I can do, the better driver I become. And as long as I will do motorsport, I will do 110%. And when I stop, I stop. What is it about growing up in the Scandinavian countries that makes you guys such good drivers? Is it the wet, dodgy conditions? Because there's a lot of fantastic drivers that come from your area. Yes, especially in, in I think, like off-road racing, or like more rally and dirt and rallycross and so on. And uh, I think, I mean, we used to say in, in the region where I live, which is quite in the forest in Sweden, so if you are two friends, you do rally, you are driver and co-driver. If you are four friends, you do a music band. Okay. So that's normally like, what's... Like Ebba. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, that's how it used to, used to be. But uh, yeah, I started to, to drive a car when I was six years old. So... Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, just to wrap up, um, where to for, for next year? Um, Championship number three, as committed, as dedicated? Yeah, I'm 100% motivated to do another year in Rallycross. Uh, but it's not clear yet what I will do next year. So it depends a little bit what's happening with Rallycross. Porsche was pulling out and so on. So it's a little bit uh, shaky days for the Rallycross, but we will see how it goes. I mean, if folks are going to stay in the sport and I will be one of the drivers there, for sure the, the championship will be the target. But um, still the, the doors for circuit racing and other sports are, are a little bit, on the, little bit open, but we'll see how it goes. After the break, we look at highlights from the Los Angeles Motor Show and Zipporah finds out if the G-Class legend is alive and well in the all-new G63. The 
Los Angeles Motor Show takes place this week, and as we head into the festive season, manufacturers use this opportunity to make sure that they are at the top of consumers' shopping lists. Even before the show, Mazda had released teaser pics of the upcoming three, and Kia gave us a sneak peek at the 2020 Soul, but it was Porsche who upstaged them all with the launch of the brand new 992 Series 911. The exterior design features a number of cues taken from the Cayenne SUV, like the deep full-width grille and the lighting strip that runs across the rear, incorporating the Porsche name. Inside you will find a completely new dash and center console design that is dominated by a 10.9-inch infotainment screen. Also renowned as one of the finest driver's cars around, the engineers have managed to shift the dynamic goalpost yet again. They did have a little help though. Wider front track is absolutely awesome and I love the moisture sensors that they have which is in the wheel arches for detecting uh, slip. It's the best system I've ever felt in dampage conditions. So I can't wait to get it on a full wet track. It's longer wheelbase as well for higher, you know, if you want to do 330 kilometers an hour with this baby on the autobahn, it's going to be very, very stable. So uh, all things, another step forward on the previous generation 991. The all-new 911 is available for order now, with the first cars expected to reach our shores by mid-2019. The fourth generation Kia Sportage debuted locally just more than two years ago, so it seems a bit early for a refresh. Nevertheless, Kia has introduced a host of detailed improvements to its compact SUV and rationalised the model lineup in a bid to enhance its appeal. Both an actually aspirated 2.4-litre and turbocharged 1.6-litre petrol engines have been dropped from the range, with buyers now having the option of a 2-litre naturally aspirated petrol or turbo diesel power plant. New to the range over is the 1.6-litre GDI or gasoline direct injection engine, utilised exclusively in the entry-level Ignite derivative. This new generation gamma engine produces 97 kilowatts with 161 newton meters of torque. And while it takes allegedly 12.1 seconds to reach the 100 kilometer mark, it emits just 170 grams per kilometer of CO2 gas. Styling revisions have been kept to a minimum. The signature tiger nose grille has been slightly revised while the headlamps remain unchanged. There's a new bumper design featuring more prominent fog light housings and at the rear, the bumper has also been reshaped to emphasize the width of the car. Inside, all models receive a sporty Stinger-inspired leather-trimmed steering wheel and gear shifter, while standard specification includes manual air conditioning, automatic headlamps, Bluetooth connectivity, a six-speaker audio system, and cruise control. We have always maintained that the curious spread of models and a huge price difference between them was a hindrance to the Sportage's sales success. With three models now coming in at well below 450,000 Rand, we expect to see many more sportages on the road. We stay with SUVs now but move way up the pricing ladder. Ever since its star studded launch back in 2011, the Range Rover Evoque has strongly resonated with celebrities the world over. So for the launch of the all new model, which took place in London this week, Land Rover invited the who's who in British show business to grace the red carpets. I mean, I love Range Rover, I've loved all of them, I've driven all of them, and I just kind of wait to see what they do next. They always do something interesting and exciting, I just want to kind of get in it now. It looks really versatile as well in terms of, for someone who spends a lot of time in a city, but it also goes to visit family, you know, outside in the countryside, it's got that kind of versatility to be able to cope with all of that. Clearly, we weren't going to find out much about the car from the rich and famous, so we decided to rather approach those who know the vehicle inside out. When you look at the vehicle, for example, it is unmistakably a Range Rover Evoque. The falling roof, the rising belt line, the characterful proportions. But then when you look closer at a second glance, you realise this is the new Evoque. It has levels of modernity and sophistication that have come about as a consequence of improvements in design enabling technologies. When you look at the car, people will see it as an evolution, so they'll recognize that familiar Evoque design. 
But from an engineering perspective, there really is a revolution under the skin. We've attacked every area of the car. It's effectively, it's an all new platform, premium transverse architecture. Sophisticated use of uh, mixed metals to deliver all of the refinement goals we set out. We've got mild hybrids on every automatic version, standard throughout, throughout the range. But the great thing about the new Evoque is that it really embodies the sort of responsible business strategy that we've put in place at a corporate level. So the Evoque has up to 33 kilograms of natural or recycled material. We're making the Dynamica microfiber suede cloth from 100% recycled microfiber polyester, which is sourced from drinks bottles. It has multiple attributes, like it's antimicrobial, it's lightweight, it's odor-free. The Range Rover Evoque is scheduled to arrive in South Africa in April next year, so best you start saving up now, as incorporating sustainable technologies into a car does not come cheap. And finally, on the topic of social media, Mercedes-Benz has become the first of Interbrand's top 100 to garner more than 1 billion likes on Instagram. An analysis by the US brand consultancy firm has shown that more than 35 million Instagram users all over the world follow the official at Mercedes-Benz account. And posts featuring the Mercedes-Benz hashtag receive over 27 million likes every single month. To thank its fans and followers, the German mark has selected photos from Instagram in which people demonstrate their affinity for the brand. And these will be displayed on a dedicated website. Go and have a look. There could be one of you and your favorite three-pointed star. And obviously the crowds flock to Killarney Racetrack to see the world's best drivers competing in the FIA World Rallycross Championship. But there are other really cool cars enthralling the crowds on the racetrack. We've got Monster Energy's Jason Webb, SA Drift Champion, getting it sideways and smoking it up. But also, our Dakar spec cars have been giving the crowds a real thrill. These are cars that are seriously capable off-road, just like the Mercedes-Benz's G63, which has just been relaunched. Zipporah is there to catch up with this legend. The G-Class is the only model in the Mercedes-Benz stable that has not known end of production. It has such a rich history that only the likes of the Suzuki Jimny and the Defender, if it was still around, can attest to. Mercedes-Benz has put out the new G63 AMG and it had me wondering, how do you improve a legend? And what makes this G such an icon? With over 20 years in the market, the Gelande Wagen has seen very little change over the years. However, being a much-loved icon as the G-Class is, does not exempt you from being made fun of. The G-Wagon has even been said to be the outgoing Toyota Venture that just went to a Model C school. The newly launched G63 maintains its characteristic shape and gets new multi-beam LED headlamps, a new AMG Pacific radiator grille, amongst a raft of internal changes. With me though, I have the Edition 1, which is easy to spot with the red lines across the side mirrors, as well as a sporty strap along the body. The previous generation G-Class's 1970s roots were also apparent in the interior. For instance, it didn't even have cup holders. Inside the cabin, the interior has been refreshed and it embodies exactly what we know Mercedes-Benz for, that is luxury and sophistication. As I said, we have with us the Edition 1, so that comes standard with red stitch trimming across the dashboard, the steering wheel, the side panels, as well as the seats. The new G63 joins the modern age with class-leading double panel 20-inch screens, the S-class steering wheel, and all the plush and elegant finishes that come with all the latest Mercedes-Benz models. The interior is just as refined as the driving experience, and that's thanks to the changes underneath the skin. What Mercedes-Benz has done is reworked the suspension as well as the chassis, and this gives a really good compliant ride. It is very solid and well planted, and I think I had my doubts about going around corners and maybe tipping off because the car is so tall. The G-Class has always given an impressive ride quality, but an apartment on wheels can only go that fast. And in the case of the G63 AMG, 
The power and agility makes tackling those corners an easy and dynamic task. Under the bonnet is a 4-litre V8 bi-turbo engine that gives all 420 kilowatts and 850 newton meters of torque. Now that is really quick, as quick as 4.4 seconds, 0 to 100 sprint. And of course, if you put your foot down, you get those beautiful V8 engine sounds. And with a touch of a button, you can control just how audible you want the exhaust noise to be, awake the neighbors kind of loud, or a subtle slick assault. Changes under the bonnet also include a new suspension system that features coils all around, and for the first time, the front axle has an independent double wishbone suspension, a rigid axle with a five-link suspension used at the rear. I mean, as luxurious as this car looks, it is built as well for some off-road driving. Um, it is capable. However, my thing is, will you really be taking your 2.5 million rand car on some crazy bundu bashing? Although we didn't get a chance to amply taste its capabilities off-road, in 2015, the Ignition team took the previous model G63 on an off-road obstacle course and it proved unstoppable. We don't doubt that the new G63 is even better. What the G63 trumps its rivals on is the ability to transition from off-road to on-road driving as a fast, sure-footed and luxurious SUV. The driving experience has also been enhanced for rear seat passengers who now benefit from considerably more room. Although Mercedes-Benz has retained the core DNA and characteristics of the G-Class, what they've managed to do is keep it contemporary in an ever-changing world. And with the AMG 63 moniker, they've made it more than adaptable. And I think that's what it is. That's what makes a true legend. And that's what makes this icon a real G. I can't think of a good enough reason why you would miss the FIA World Rally Cross Championship event in Cape Town. But if you did, please don't make that mistake again next year. Open your diaries right now, block those dates off in December and go and book your tickets. Just do it. Next week, the Ignition GT team catches up with Car Magazine for their performance shootout. And we celebrate the Jaguar XJ's 50th birthday. But until then, you look after yourselves.